Hello Void and all who inhabit it. It's me, another reader with the tendency to spend all day burning through one book. I don't recommend spending eight hours reading a book, but occasionally I find novels I have to finish in one sitting. I recently got my hands on a digital copy of Deathless Divide, Justine Ireland's sequel to her 2018 young adult novel, Dread Nation, and decided to spend all night reading it. If you're unfamiliar with either book, well, one, I hope you're okay with spoilers, and two, the novels take place in an alternate timeline where the Civil War is brought to an end because of the rise of zombies, known in this universe as Shamblers. We follow the lives of Jane and Catherine, who start their story as attendants or combat trained girls who serve as protectors for rich white ladies and end up traveling west from Baltimore to California. Imagine mixing Oregon Trail with The Walking Dead, then sprinkle a bit of YA romantic tension. Oh, and of course, period relevant racism. As with all things I spoil, I recommend you check out the original material regardless of this review in order to form your own opinion, especially because so much of this breakdown is going to focus on the events of the sequel and the foundational aspects of the series as we see them play out in the second book. Let's start with the plot. The plot was a thing. It occurred. It wasn't terrible, I'll say that. I think something that maybe refreshing isn't the best word but it's just different about this book compared to older ideas of YA is that bad stuff happens fairly frequently life is not fair for these girls and as a reader you are reminded of that and in that the story is realistic well as real as in following the rules set by the universe created also bad people die like the shelf life for most villains is pretty short and characters like Sue and Tomas, who might easily have been killed in traditional horror story, get to live to the end. Which was great because when they were introduced with a sympathetic story attached, I was waiting for doom. So yay for that. However, a lot of the details of the plot fall flat. For one, there are a lot of untied ends. I'll talk about this more later, but Catherine had this plan to set up her life for her and Lily that vanishes once Sacramento is in ruins. She spent nearly two years building up to create a foundation for this girl and we don't see how that changes once their plans have to change. Also, a lot of people just disappear and it doesn't always feel like a consequence of the universe. Like losing track of Miss Anderson when Baltimore falls makes sense. But Lucas, who seems sweet on Sue, decides to go back to the Lost States and that potential romantic subplot just sinks for no reason. We're told the importance of characters when they're allowed to stick around or when they're written out and how. Pastor Snyder, who Jane left for dead at the end of the last book, popping up as a shambler at the beginning of this book, illuminates this point both from a character importance tied to book time perspective and from a finished storylines perspective. Though seeing Pastor Snyder high key ends up not to matter because another seemingly important plot point that was weakly done was dealing with the personal emotional consequences of what happened at the end of the last book. Catherine makes a big fuss about Jane having killed the sheriff and the resolution to that, given how long it bothered Catherine for even if it didn't bother Jane, was flat. Which connects to my bigger issue with the plot. Some things just didn't make sense or the explanation was lackluster. The idea of Jackson's hate potentially just being Jane's guilt was a good tension until it's resolved with, yep, your immunity is what killed me, that's why you feel guilty, admit that and you'll feel better. Jane didn't believe she was immune until she was bit, but Jackson's ghost pops up before then. And when Jane is happy, Jackson's ghost isn't around. So what's the connection between her guilt, her revenge path, and her love life? Because the tension in her relationship with Callie, who she agreed on day one to hug Gideon down with, is what triggers Jackson popping up again not Jane's initial desire to hunt Gideon down, for example. Also, Jane makes the guess that the Horde in Summerlin waited to attack because of the number of vaccinated people around, that if there are more or an equal amount of vaccinated people to unvaccinated, the Shamblers wait. Now, when Jackson died, they were traveling in a group of eight and the only vaccinated or even potentially vaccinated person, take a shot every time I say vaccinated, was Jane, 
who was yards away when Jackson got bit. Why would the Shamblers have waited? Or better yet, why have Jane pieced together that the ratio of vaccinated to unvaccinated people matters and have several points where it seems like the Shamblers across the country are getting smarter only to connect the fault of Jackson's death to Jane's vaccination? Because a solution to Jane's guilt wouldn't have been admittance that Jackson's ghost was right, but to have realized that she had nothing to feel guilty about in the first place and forgive herself. That math doesn't add up. Some other things that ain't add up. What was the point of Jane reading that letter if no one ever looked for Jackson's wife and child? How the f*** did Gideon destroy literally all of Sacramento? Why would the mayor of Nicodemus, a majority black town out on the prairie, put any level of trust in a random white man, let alone so much trust? Where is Lily at the end of this all? Is she still embroidering a dress on someone's living room floor? Why would you name your sons Romeo and Tybalt? If you or a loved one know the answer to one or many of these questions, please tell me because the inconsistencies made this book hard to get through. I read it all in one day because I reached a point where I knew if I put it down, I wasn't going to want to pick it back up. But I'm stubborn and need answers, so I churned through it all. Beyond the plot, though, I had some bigger issues. Buckle up. The first is the world building. This series addresses a lot of systems of inequality that we are familiar with in real life, and I think this book aims to subvert tropes, but often ends up reinforcing stereotypes or tropes that are just as bad in the process. The book is most progressive in its views of sexuality. There's a part where Catherine's talking about the lack of romantic attraction she feels to people, and I don't remember if she compared herself to Jane directly, but it made me think of this old Tumblr post where someone suggested making a sitcom with an asexual person and a pansexual person and calling it all or nothing. That's basically the end of this book, featuring Daniel Redfern. I liked that Catherine, at least internally, is comfortable with discussing her lack of romantic attraction to people, and I liked that several women in the book were partnered with each other. I think it's kind of odd to have a universe where racial relations are pretty much the same, but people are seemingly chill with women loving women. But I'm also not an LGBTQ history expert, so maybe that wasn't too anachronistic. I will say that the only man-loving man we see is Carolina, who's described as having partnered with many men. Many, 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 many men. But is never in a relationship. And the women-loving women relationships we saw are between two sex workers who get killed, the main character who gets robbed by her partner, and a side character who is actually single because her partner's family didn't approve. Though whether it's because of racism or homophobia or a combination isn't clear. It's dope to see black girl characters being asexual and bi slash pansexual, but I watched enough logo short films in high school to know the youth can get better than a handful of couples who don't make it to the end of the story intact. And I'd be remiss if I didn't address the fact that between the two main characters, the one who is more romantically inclined to the point where other characters describe how intensely she pursues relationships is the darker of the two, while the lighter character remaining unattainable feels like tiptoeing the line of a trope. And I describe Catherine's asexuality as her quote unquote remaining unattainable because she often talks about it because someone's pursuing her or she's talking about her identity in conjunction to expectations she's avoiding or manipulating. She will always be pursued, but she will never be interested. Her asexuality is a point plot, not a character trait. That is meant to challenge this trope of a light-skinned girl always being pursued and enjoying it. And I think Ireland tries to further offset that trope by revealing Catherine's mother as a madam and that's at the root of why she feels the way she does but the connection that your mother being Margaret Wells had an impact on your sexual identity kind of feels like something must have happened to you when you were a kid and that's why you're gay which goes back to subverting tropes by reinforcing other ones. The difference in the portrayal of Jane and Catherine's sexuality is a prime example of the concerns I had when looking at how the book addressed colorism. Catherine is able to pass, and the topic of passing does come up quite a bit because there are several other characters who can as well. A lot of the black characters were mixed with something, which is accurate to a lot of black Americans in real life. 
The narrative is set up to comment on the varying hues of blackness at multiple levels, but to be making commentary about passing and colorism with the difference in how Jane and Catherine are treated within the narrative and then have very few darker characters be important or have purpose beyond serving these two girls is icky. I gotta bring up Sue because one, I love her, and two, there's a scene towards the end of the book where she calls Jane and Catherine out on having never asked for her thoughts because they think she doesn't have any. Sue goes on to share her opinion on the issue of the moment, which is pretty accurate, and then spends the rest of the book saying maybe like three lines. The issue was addressed, and then Ireland went back to perpetuating it. Beyond Sue, there are three named dark-skinned women. Ida, who they met in Summerland before and leaves fairly early in this book. Nessie, who's one of the sex workers who dies, but not before being forced to run next to a wagon while one of the white ladies drove it. I don't know why that irked me. I was just like, if I was taking out my emotional turmoil on the innocent people traveling with me, I still would have made all the white ladies run and let the black lady drive the wagon. Like, that's just me. I don't know. The third named dark-skinned black female character is Melly May, who is one of the other women loving women, a boarding house owner, and Carolina's sister. As for named black male characters, we have a few options, starting with Dr. Nielsen, who is light enough to pass but doesn't like to, while simultaneously having a dark-skinned henchman, associate, assistant, who stands behind him looking menacing. The rest of the named black men we meet are all dark-skinned. Lucas, whose storyline is pretty similar to Ida's. They met him in Summerland and he leaves early on in the book and again is set up to have a romantic subplot with Sue that just crumbles in the dust. Later in the book we meet Jebediah or just Jeb who is also dark-skinned and from the Lost States and he doesn't say much. Earlier I mentioned that getting introduced to characters who I thought would die but who actually lived was refreshing but now I'm thinking it was just bad writing. We get introduced to Jeb when an exposition team needs to be formed to see what's going on with the river, and he has a moment where he's pulled aside by his wife who's upset to see him go, but that's it. I think he mentions that he has family in the city, but hella people on the Oregon Trail do, so why should I care more about you than about them? I think, honestly, he was just there to have a very, like, Killmonger moment. You know that scene at the end of Black Panther when Killmonger says, um throw me in the ocean with my ancestors like that type of line Jeb has a line where he basically says like racism is just as much if not more dangerous to black people in the south than the zombies and it's like okay cool you made you said this thing you you got this line in did you need to make a whole character to do that like we met so many people from the lost states why wasn't that message translated through any one of them I don't know girl moving on also met on the Oregon Trail there's Mr. Stevens, who I have written in my notes is bougie, big headed and dark skin. <laughs> He's good at Bible study, bad at catching hints. His character is there to remind us that even in a dystopia, men will be men. That's pretty much it. I don't mind that his character is kind of like just there to be there, you know. Then there's Carolina, who in his very first scene is described as being and I quote, the kind of man a young lady fair of face could trust. Which when I first read it, I was like, what does that mean? And Catherine goes on to say it's because that he's gay. But if that's the reason why you can trust him, it's not because you like skin. It's because he likes dick. <laughs> and at the time of reading, that line didn't make sense to me. Like, why wouldn't he just be the kind of man a single young lady, period? could trust but looking back at it it's really interesting that that's in his initial description because one Catherine notes multiple times that he's upset whenever she or Dr. Nielsen choose not to pass which is such an interesting mentality for a dark-skinned person to have that we never unpack and two when Jane returns he spends a lot of time disliking her by means of trying to be overly protective to Catherine and only Catherine, mind you, despite the fact that earlier we are told that he sees both Catherine and Sue as sisters. So you got this big black man with his big powerful sword trying to protect this light-skinned white passing girl from another black woman who is light, yes, but still darker and visibly coated as black? 
Okay, okay. Wait, there's also the stupid <laughs> mayor of Nicodemus whose trust and belief in white people lead to the destruction of his whole town. He has nice sideburns and two mixed children. Which brings us to the next point. Beyond colorism, this book tackles more racial dynamics than the first as we're introduced to more different groups through the girls' travels, namely indigenous and Chinese communities. I think it's dope that this book brings up the history of black indigenous relations. If you can find it, I really recommend this movie called Unbowed, which similarly addresses this history, though in a very different way. Regardless, the historical dynamic between black communities and indigenous communities is integral to American history and it's not discussed enough. Same can be said about the contributions and impact of Chinese communities in California and the West as a whole. That being said, this book says some f***ed up things. And while some of them are like, this is how people used to talk back in the day-ish, you know, because it's, it's not, it's fiction. Other comments are disparaging. The only non-black community that is seen positively is a small group of Californios, the book's term for mestizo people, that Jane gets info, food, and her young ward, the moss from. Though in her first interaction with Maria, the mother of a saloon owner, Jane was confused for a Californio, and Maria spent the whole time speaking to her in Spanish, which makes me wonder if that's a projection of the author's own comfort being based in her potential to be identified as a part of the group and thus accepted by it. Because on the flip side, for the indigenous and Chinese people, we get to read a whole lot about the work their communities put into undermining black people. Everything doesn't have to be each one reach one, teach one, and change the world. We can share historical facts or historically parallel facts that aren't always positive, but for what reason are you drawing this to the reader's attention? There are no named Chinese characters that speak in the book. May, who is Melly May's ex-partner, is the only named Chinese character and she never shows up because her parents took her away. And for indigenous people, there is Daniel Redfern, who actually... Let's go into the next section. Character development. The character development in this book was weak. Point blank period new paragraph. Daniel Redfern, girl. He is coming for Taylor Swift's crown as top snake in charge, honey. And that is toxic. Indigenous people are often stereotyped in media as being violent or uncivilized, but they are also often stereotyped as being untrustworthy. Having the only indigenous man in the entire series be so sometimey and shifty that the two main characters joke about still not trusting him until the literal last page of the book is a big issue. There is another indigenous man, my bad, I keep forgetting about the Nicodemus people, Callie's brother, who was gone so fast I don't even remember his name is probably also half Cherokee, but he only exists to tell Jane that she's right, that Gideon is a madman, and then he dies. Redfern, which, girl, he got that name from the white people who ran the school, as in, that was also their last name? Are we sure about that? He does tell Jane a little bit about his background, having also been in the combat school. But back to point number two of this whole rant, his background doesn't make sense. Most super individualistic culture mindsets come from what is labeled as the West, which basically just means white people run societies. Most communities of color, probably even more so back in the back if we want to be historically parallel, are collectivists in nature, meaning they value the group and emphasize selflessness. Now, I don't know which indigenous community Red Friend is a part of. He himself might not know, and I can't remember if he ever said it, my bad. But I'm willing to bet that before he was snatched up, he wasn't raised to be a selfish asshole. So to hear a story that seeing that little white girl get ate up, let him know to always put himself first, and more so that he was quick to run and leave people behind even before that, felt off. Because where did he learn that self-centeredness from? I would think his reaction would have been the same as Jane's, to think that the little white girl was a hero, which... We don't have time to unpack that, honey. Like, what happened after she got ate up that made him think heroes are stupid? I don't think it was just that. 
So beyond his character being a horrible stereotype, his rationale doesn't make sense. Callie, the other major indigenous character, albeit half black, is also portrayed as being untrustworthy. Before she robs Jane, she's described as looking like a pixie, giving this image of mischief. Her love of Gideon, or former love of Gideon, brings her loyalty into question. And maybe even that was supposed to foreshadow her willingness to, as Jane puts it, show kindness to murderers. And I do think that we're supposed to layer on feelings of distrusting indigenous communities onto Callie. But she, like Sue, is a major secondary character who doesn't get the time or space to explain herself. While many of the side and secondary characters are flat, the most unenjoyable instances of flat characters occur with the main two, Jane and Catherine. Despite starting as foils for each other, they don't have equitable depth of character, even that much depth, period. For example, their backgrounds. In this book, we learn that Catherine ran away from New Orleans, but she never really expands on why or why thinking of her mother causes her internal tension. At the same time, though, she consistently wants to go back to New Orleans because she sees it as a good starting point for whatever they want to do. And while that's explained logistically, the potential emotional strain it would have on Catherine is never explored. As for Jane, she is constantly longing for home, her mother, and Aunt Aggie, which is yet another dynamic worth unpacking at another time. Though even when Jane is reunited with her mom, she's instantly disgusted. And that reaction isn't totally out of left field, it's more like left center field. Meeting back up with her mom and Aunt Aggie has been her motivation since the first chapter of the first book, and the resolution is done in like two chapters? We spend a lot of time with Jane's fantasized reunion. Why isn't time spent with Jane dissecting why she reacted to her mom like that and how reality didn't match her fantasy? The end to her quest is not an enjoyable character trajectory, it's a rushed one. As for Catherine, we spend a lot of time in her head learning about how she sees her sexual or romantic orientation. It's clear how she feels in that regard, but it's to the point that she seems to only be her sexuality and her physical appearance, and specifically her asexuality being the means by which she rebukes the expectations laid on her because of her physical appearance. Because again, I feel like her asexuality is the answer to the plot instead of that just being an aspect of her identity. She has a moment where she says she likes to get dressed up because it feels like she's getting ready to face the world, like her corset doubles as armor. And that's like the deepest thing we learn about her. I ended the book feeling like Catherine, although given a point of view, was just there to serve Jane's story. She didn't have any drive that was unattached to Jane. Her desire to protect Lily, for example, is mostly because Catherine believes Jane dead, not because like they both pass and she feels like she can mentor her or something, you know, like just anything. Catherine at one point says she knows emotions aren't how to get to Jane, but obligation. And that's a lot of what her character becomes, someone who moves out of obligation, which might have been a cool theme to explore because the ones that were chosen, I don't think were done well, which I think in large part is due to pacing. This book should have been two books. It's split pretty evenly down the middle and both parts spend the first third traveling, but in the first part, once they arrive in Nicodemus, they spend the rest of that part there pulling apart that aspect of the story. In the second part, they don't find Gideon until the 20th chapter. In the remaining five chapters of the book, they will escape his lab, kill him, arrive in Haven, attend Sue's wedding, and decide to leave again. Beyond pacing, having two separate books would have allowed more time to unpack some of the existential questions and bigger themes set up. The major theme or major question that is set up in this book is the idea of being a killer versus a survivor. We see Daniel Redfern, who serves as a cautionary tale to the loneliness that awaits survivors, change his tune after losing someone he loved deeply, which was a, a choice both in that that person was a white lady and that Sue later suggests that Miss Duncan, said white lady, also wasn't sh <laughs> Regardless, Daniel shifts from being self-serving to being more of an anti-hero. 
but the novel doesn't deeply explore what it means to be sculpted as a tool for violence or to be seen as nothing more than a tool for violence and still want to be caring. Especially because Jane and Catherine have to care for Tomas and Lily, or even looking at them in contrast to Sue, who desperately wants to become a wife and mother. She's trained to kill just like them. Add on top that she's tall, dark, and while she was still wielding a scythe is described by Jane as looking like death personified, how is she grappling with this same question? Especially if we're laying in colorism, which has a huge impact on how black women get treated in love and in being seen as people who can be soft or vulnerable. That would have been cool to read. Or even to have Jane and Catherine talk more in the scene that sets up this question for the rest of the book. Jane asks if they're murderers and Catherine says no, they're survivors. But before she answers, she's worried that Jane thinks poorly of her and then realizes, oh no, she's grappling with something different, something deeper. So then have them talk about it more then. I think we could have seen more of how each of these girls, or again, even just Jane and Catherine, are crafting their ideas of love and family and worthiness and why. I will say we see Jane's issues with abandonment and her later self-deprecating feelings based on what she's done, but that feels flat because we don't see how she grows from one state to the next. This scene in the beginning of the book that sets up this question is also really interesting because Catherine thinks Jane's question is rooted in her actions when it's actually rooted in Jackson's opinions of her actions, which the opinions of others later become something Jane no longer cares about. The dots are there, but we're missing the scenes connecting them. Like how does Jane go from someone who is so worried about that to becoming someone who's like, I'ma cut everybody up like filet mignon, I don't give a, it's such a missed opportunity. This question is also a missed opportunity to look at Callie's unwillingness to kill. She wasn't trained the way the other three were, which I think is important when developing her character, but instead her distaste in killing their bounties is supposed to show Jane's revenge is extreme and reinforce a distaste for Callie because at best she's unsupportive of Jane and at worst she's more sympathetic towards the bounties than to Jane. Speaking of Jane's relationships, her conversation with Jackson about why he didn't pick her almost had me quit this book in the first three chapters, especially because his dying wish was the f***ing opposite. He didn't say, get my sister to my wife. He said, take care of her. His ghost, if you believe that was him and not Jane's guilt, says the same, that Lily's safety is now Jane's burden. Now, why would a man who hours earlier basically said, you don't have a nurturing bone in your body, do that? He was dying. He had little time to say what he wanted. Girl, he was dying for a good five, six pages for dang near a whole chapter. The choice was deliberate to have him say that. Then we have Callie robbing Jane, which I've brought up like five times because that does not make sense to me. I don't think we're ever supposed to trust Callie, which again is a separate issue, but that doesn't negate the dynamics of her relationship with Jane or the fact that her character should have been developed. There needs to be a reason as to why she would rob Jane beyond, well, you're not supposed to like her. Especially because at the end, Catherine becomes her foil in that Catherine is willing to support Jane and follow Jane even when she doesn't agree with her just because she wants to support her. Jane's relationships are supposed to fall under the are you a killer, or are you a survivor umbrella with the answer to that question impacting the end results of her relationships, but showing this black girl be rejected again and again, told that she isn't nurturing enough, is more than that. My bigger issue with Jane's interactions with Jackson and Callie is that she never seemingly gets an answer she's happy with to her question of if she is someone who can be loved deeply, if at all. Because running parallel to this question of what are you is are you worthy of care? which is a question it sounds like she would have had even if Jackson lived. Sue says he would have kept breaking her heart. And even when Jane is with Callie, she's at times worried slash jealous that Callie still cares for Gideon. Jane is continuously doubting or put in the position to doubt if she's truly loved. 
love and more so loyalty is the other huge poorly explored theme in this book. By the end, Catherine is clearly supposed to be Jane's answer, but after Jane quotes the Golden Girls theme song at the end of the first part, they kind of spin their wheels at the depth at which they talk about their relationship. What is the root of Catherine's devotion that has her willing to follow Jane to the ends of the earth? Because it can't just be blanket loyalty. If it is, that's whack. It feels kind of whack that these two girls find love, platonic, but love all the same in each other. And that isn't explored as deeply or as frequently as, say, Catherine's asexuality or Jane's desires for revenge. Also kind of whack that they only talk about their friendship when they're fighting, hurting, or apologizing for having fought or hurt the other. I think Catherine spends way too much of this book in her head when she could have unpacked the same feelings and nourished the storyline and her character development through actual conversation. Jane, I don't think, really grew. I think she reached different stages of her characterization without us seeing the bridges between. Consider the following. Why does Jane hate Gideon so much more than Callie when Gideon's actions directly led to the death of Callie's entire family? Why don't we ever unpack and assuage the guilt Catherine feels for abandoning Jane and how that fuels her behavior? How does Jane become someone who is okay with mutilating criminals, especially given she's with Callie during that time and for the most part happy? What does Catherine want to do with her life? Truly. Jane suggests that she might be lost forever if she were to learn her mom and Aunt Aggie didn't make it. Well, Aunt Aggie doesn't make it, and her mom is less than what she expected. How does she deal with that beyond stomping off, especially when her mom emotionally manipulates her into staying in her house? How does she reckon with the internal tension that she needs to leave to be happy? She just gets to that solution, and we don't see how or why. Overall, I'd give this book a 6 out of 10. I think if you were invested in the characters in the first book, you'll want to see how their stories ended in this book. That was my main motivation for reading. I think also if you... I'm trying to say this in the least shady way as possible. If you like easily digestible social commentary, you'll also like the larger comments being made, or at least the fact that larger societal comments are being made. But the details of this novel are weak. I read this book in one night, and so the issues I have with plot and character development were likely more apparent than they would have been if I read it over two weeks. But regardless, the answers to the big questions posed and the larger interpersonal themes set up in this book were lackluster. If I spaced out my reading, it would have been more difficult to fine-tune my issues, but they still would have been there. Despite the cool characters and the interesting concept, this story was not as strong as it could have been. If you made it to the end, thank you for making it to the end. I think my next video cast is going to be on The Sims again. I already shouted into Twitter about it though, so I might be satisfied enough for now. I'm trying to watch Little Fires Everywhere, but I see where we're going and I, I can't. I, I really don't think I can. Oh, I forgot to say, if you're interested in a YA novel that features main female characters of color who are also LGBT and living in a parallel to real life dystopia, check out We Set the Dark on Fire. I got a copy to the sequel and might read it all in one night too, so that's the third option for the next video cast. Either way, I'll be back next week with another voice memo. Until then, stay safe. I'll see you in the next echo chamber.